गुड इवनिंग सर we are able to see the slide sir not a slide show yeah but you see the slide isn't it ah yes yeah, sir we can see sir yes okay you want me to, is, is this okay or you is there something else which i need to do uh no sir uh, we want that uh, proper uh, slide show sir uh, means like the, uh, we can see sir uh, but uh, big screen uh, is not there Is it okay now? Uh, uh, sir, uh, we can see the slide list, uh, but uh, slide show doesn't happen, sir. Here, I am on the Mac, so I really don't know. Oh, okay, sir. Uh. So let me know when to start. Sir, uh, we can start, sir. Uh, okay, then. Fine. Uh, okay, you're able to see the slides now. Uh, is it okay? Uh, no. uh one second sir uh, no sir now slide is not there sir and uh, now it came sir uh, is it on uh, slides are on sir uh, okay so then i'll start uh, if the slides are visible Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 So uh, this uh, uh, set of uh, slides, images, presentation is mainly focused on mitral valve, and uh, the primary aim objective of this uh, one is to just to review, brush up some basics, uh, which is the one which is frequently uh, under scrutiny and focus, where the examiners Uh, try to assess you as to how much you know in terms of basics, and uh, generally, uh, I, I guess you all know that you are asked to do the echo and then uh, show some measurements, and then afterwards the discussion takes place about hemodynamics and further so forth. So I will just focus on the basics uh, in this particular uh, presentation. Just a brief uh, sort of overview of the mitral. analysis here and uh, uh, you can see that the mitral valve has this annulus and this is where the uh, this ridge this is how the annulus actually looks like in uh, real time when the surgeon opens up the uh, left atrium so this is seen from the left atrial side and uh, what you see here is the anterior mitral leaflet the pml and uh, what is important is to understand that you have these scallops which are hallmarks character characteristic of the posterior mitral leaflet so you have these anatomical delineations uh, which differentiate each scallop from the other 
which you don't see it on the antimicrobial leaflets. So the scallops. Uh -huh. So uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, yeah. So we can't see the slides, sir. Actually. No. What exactly? Uh, now, now we can see, sir. I, I don't know. Yeah, but, um, um, what exactly? Um, because I go to the. Uh, anyone uh, with Mac can help. Uh, Rajesh, uh, you there? Uh, sir, uh, you can zoom, I think, sir. Uh, in that, uh, if you zoom, it may enlarge, sir. Zoom is now 68, sir. In the left upper corner, sir. Left upper corner. 68% uh, zoom is there, sir. Um, just above that slide, sir. Like. Left upper corner only, sir. The second one, sir. Left upper. So below that, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. If you can zoom it. Uh, okay, I made it 75. Because yeah, I have to go to play. the slide. Yes, sir. So when I yes, do sir. this, only then the play comes. You still don't see it? Uh, sir, I think when you start on that play, no, sir, uh, we are not able to see, see those sides, I think. Mm. I'm not sure. Is that which I? Harshal uh, Patil, you are there, Harshal. Sir, uh, if you don't know, can you go to the left upper corner? There is one option, no, sir. View option. Left upper corner, sir. View option. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, you press that one, sir. Once. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now. Um, sir, uh, sir, but, but it will be like this. It will. Uh, not be the actual play yes, sir in that it may come it may give option sir if you press the uh, that lower cursor is there no sir in the view the lower cursor yes yeah, yeah, sir some, uh, that lower arrow sir arrow in the view sir you near the view sir okay so what do I do here now? Uh, sir has clicked on that view. I think nothing came. Uh, sir, can you click again, sir? On that view. Maybe we'll do one thing, sir. That zoom only will make it maximum uh, as much as it uh, fits uh, the screen, sir. And then we'll uh, go like that only, sir. Okay. Um... Now it's 75. You can make it maximum, sir, if you want. Ah, oh, yeah, sir. Okay, let's try this. Let's. Um, what's uh, okay? So you're uh, able to see now. Ah, yes, yeah, sir. We can see it's uh, moving also. Fine. So it will be a little bit of a, um, okay. I'll go like this. Uh, so this is uh, uh, just, yes. Okay, so it's just improvisation. So uh, let me fix it for the next time later on. Uh, this is just to sort of uh, get you people to know the mitral anatomy, uh, how well uh, uh, you need to sort of understand this. So. Uh, this is just a close look as to how you can see it from the left atrial side. And the main message as far as this slide is concerned is that you have these uh, different scallops. So scallops are the hallmark or the characteristic feature of the posterior mitral leaflet. So you have this clear anatomical delineation. You have these ridges here, these anatomical ridges. And these are the ones which divide them into scallops. 
uh, the same thing you don't see it on the anteromitral leaflet. So the corresponding uh, anteromitral segment is called uh, typically the A1, P1 uh, or so forth like that. So the PML is the one which has got the uh, scallops very clearly uh, seen. Now uh, this is uh, something from the uh, 3D. So can we have uh, 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 some questions from answers, uh, responses from your side? So quickly we can just brush up the anatomy. So what leaflet would this be? The one which I'm showing. And yeah, later later later. Later. Okay. That would be the posterior mitral leaflet here. And uh, uh, these are the three segments which you see here of the posterior mitral leaflet. So which segment would this be? P3, sir. P1. P3, sir. P3. 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 So just to get the anatomy correct, so you have the aortic valve here and you have the tricuspid valve on this side, and then faintly you can see the pulmonary valve here. And this is from the left atrial side. So the appendage will come somewhere on this side. So the segment which is on the tricuspid side is always the third segment, and the segment on the atrial appendage side is always the uh, first segment. So that is how you can try to remember. So uh, three, tricuspid or atrial appendage, that, that is one. So this would be the uh, way you can look at the uh, segments. So just to look at it, so left atrial appendage, you have the septum, and then you have these three segments here. And now I'm going to look at the uh, anatomy of the annulus. So uh, what would this uh, part of the annulus be called as? Automatic cutting. Yeah, okay, but the annulus I'm talking about. So if I have to call the annulus anatomically uh, in terms Central of nerve. what portion of the annulus would this be called? That's the rigid fibrous part, sir. Okay, so that is the anterior mitral annulus. So this part here. And uh, you would call this as the posterior mitral annulus. So uh, that would be the annulus here. The score up. And... Uh, Okay, so now next is, uh, uh, what are the st structures here? You, this you've already told me, this is the aortomitral curtain here. So what comes here at this point? Right this fibrous trigone. Okay, so this would be the right trigone uh, or the medial line. This is the lateral trigone. So this has got uh, uh, anatomical relationship to the non-coronary cusp and you have the septal leaflet here and then you have the anterior mitral leaflet. So this is part of the uh, this fibrous skeleton. And as somebody mentioned, so this is the rigid uh, fibrous uh, side. And uh, this side is not so fibrous. It is a little bit of uh, muscularity is also there. So this is uh, the one which tends to dilate. And this is the reason why the uh, when they, during the mitral valve repair, they put the most posterior mitral ring, uh, the mitral ring which uh, uh, is uh, fixed in the posterior mitral annulus. So that would be the anatomy of the annulus. So the medial or the right trigone, and then you have the aortomitral curtain, and then you have the lateral uh, trigone here. Now, it is also important that you sort of uh, need to know the uh, arteries also, which is in relationship posteriorly. So you have the circumflex artery. These are the vessels. And then you have the coronary sinus, which comes posteriorly at this point here. So in terms of uh, transcatheter uh, uh, involvement in uh, procedures, so and in terms of uh, other uh, procedures, so th these vessels are very important to be kept in mind uh, so uh, that uh, it does not cause any uh, uh, pr problems in, in towards that side. And uh, now let me go to this part here. So this is how the papillary muzzle would look like. You have the primary and then you have the secondary heads. So you have these multiple heads. And uh, uh, this would be the cordae. So these are the cordae, very thin uh, cordae. And again, you can have uh, different types of cordae. Uh, uh, can anybody tell me the types of cordae which uh, one can classify? Primary, uh, first order. Primary, secondary, and first order, second order. Right. So you have one is 
primary uh, secondary sir correct and tertiary correct so you can have the primary you have the secondary or the uh, the, uh, the 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 basal cordae so let us have a closer look uh, at these cordae here so what you see here is uh, uh, the near end this is the anterior mitral leaflet here and towards the far end here that is a posterior mitral leaflet you just see the uh, edges here so the important thing is that you have this very clear area the clear zone of the anterior mitral leaflet so here you don't get to see the cord except that uh, these are the two strut cordes but apart from that it is a very clear zone so the anterior mitral leaflet towards the mid towards the base it does not have cordae except for these uh, uh, strut cordes which are there but the posterior mitral leaflet has cordes extending at the margins in the mid and towards the base so that is the difference between the two uh, leaflets and uh, this is how the strut cordae looks like you can see that uh, these are the th thick ones so this uh, gives uh, uh, the uh, the geometry to the uh, the lv so any time this goes the, the lv geometry is also affected and uh, uh, as we discussed uh, as we mentioned earlier so this would be the marginal cordae or the primary cordae which attaches to the margin of the leaflets and this is the one which causes the prolapse whenever there is elongation or whether whenever there is rupture and you have these secondary cordae uh, which uh, come towards the mid portion and then you have the basal or the tertiary cordae uh, which is uh, more towards the basal segment and then you have the commercial cordae also so this is uh, just a brief look at the anatomy so now let me take you through a series of images and uh, this is where you will have to keep uh, uh, sort of uh, making some comments or uh, any findings which you come across so uh, what uh, would you sort of uh, start with? So you're shown this image, and how would you like to describe this? There is a mode image at uh, uh, the mitral valve level, showing thickening of the AML, and uh, there's a paradoxical uh, placement like a mitral stenosis. So there's a PML, anterior displacement of the PML. The right. PML. right. So. Uh, those are the characteristic hallmarks. So you have uh, the thickening of the leaflets here, and then uh, you have the flattening of the EF slope. Normally, the EF slope is uh, it goes in a steep sort of uh, direction, but here you can see that it is uh, more flattened here. The thickening, as we said, and then the the characteristic, the hallmark which uh, needs to be mentioned when question is asked is uh, uh, of the rheumatic heart disease is this. Uh, anterior movement of the posterior mitral leaflet. So this is the paradoxical movement of the PML. So this uh, would uh, uh, sort of uh, um, you know, convey the message as to why this is a rheumatic heart disease mitral stenosis uh, image. Now, uh, 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 just a brief uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, comment about the MOD itself. So why is, uh, what is the uh, characteristic uh, of M mode, what is so great about M mode in terms of image? What is the advantage of using M mode here? Temporal resolution is very high, sir. Okay, so how high would you see? So, anywhere from around 2000 to 3000 frames per second. So, that is how high the frames of the M mode is. So, that's the reason why. Uh, it is used for these sort of uh, uh, findings which needs to be identified. So the uh, importance of MOD and uh, what is uh, unique about it. Now, uh, let me go to the next image. Now, uh, this is fairly obvious, fairly simple, nothing great about it. But just again, the questioning will uh, be sort of directed towards you as to how would you approach uh, this patient and try to get a good uh, mitral stenosis orifice. So what would be your approach? You're doing an echo and uh, how would you go about getting this particular image? So going to papillary muscle level and then coming back to the mitral leaflet and uh, measuring at the tip of the mitral leaflet will be ideal. Okay, so that is correct. So at the end. Yes. So you start from the apex or the uh, the papillary uh, level and then you sweep it up. 
So as you keep coming towards the mitral valve, the smallest orifice is what uh, you try to get, and uh, that is the one which you end up uh, doing the area. Now, what are the limitations of this? This particular method, so what are the limitations? What can cause problems? What can get you into trouble? Eco dropout variable. Uh, eco dropout, okay. Apart from that, any other comment? So, well, well, thickening is there. Sometimes that can overestimate them. Valvular thickening. Okay, so uh, what you can do is you can put it in a better way. So you can say that uh, the mitral valve, uh, as it approaches towards the, uh, the the smallest orifice, it is funnel shaped. So to come uh, to the exact point where you need to get the smallest orifice, which is your objective, you may not get it. You might be oblique and uh, you might be tangential and uh, that is uh, one fallacy uh, where you can go wrong and that is why you have these variations next is if you have a lot of calcification so you again have problems you may not be able to get the exact uh, uh, tracing you might have uh, a very sort of fussy or maybe sometimes even dropouts at the point where the uh, the, the leaflet margins, uh, so you may not be able to trace it properly. So in that case, uh, the best you can do is try to reduce the gain and try to get the orifice uh, uh, sort of delineated in a much better way. So some sort of uh, uh, limitation uh, as far as 2D planimetry is concerned. And uh, next, uh, let us uh, look at this uh, 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 what method would you say that uh, we would like to get a mitral area here? What would you call this? Again, very simple, very basic, but you know, just running through the whole thing. Pressure of time. Continuity right. equations. Okay. So, what is the pressure of time uh, uh, calculation? How would you calculate the pressure of time? The mitral valve area from pressure of time. So, 220 divided by. Uh, uh, pressure of time. So. Okay. So 220 divided by the pressure of time. So the what is the, how do you define pressure of time? The uh, time taken by the gradient to uh, reduce to 50 percent from peak to 50 percent to the baseline. So from the peak, how much of time it takes to get to the half of the uh, the 50 percent of the gradient so that is how you the, the, basically it's the deceleration slope 50 percent of it so that is how you would be looking to define the pressure of time so what are the problems associated with this uh, method in terms of uh, calculating measuring the pressure of uh, the valve associated associated valvular lesions like mr AR and AS, any associated valvular lesion can underestimate or overestimate the mitral valve areas. Atrial fibrillation, uh, although we can Tachycardia. average the readings, sir, but it's not reliable. Mm -hmm. Tachycardia. Do you think uh, mitral regurgitation will uh, alter the slope? Uh, sir, uh, flow across the mitral valve will increase. So, so, uh, so that so acute in terms of mitral valve area. So the pressure of yes. time method to calculate mitral valve area. So do you think mitral regurgitation will be uh, an element which can cause problems? So acute MR can. Mm, not acute MR. OK, what I'm trying to convey is that uh, if you look at the slope, primarily you're looking at the slope, isn't it? So the more the slope is flattened, the more severe the stenosis. Now, if you have a lot of uh, uh, atrial uh, sort of uh, aortic regurgitation, not atrial, aortic regurgitation, so severe or more than moderate aortic regurgitation will increase the uh, LV filling pressure, the LVEDP. So then what will happen is this will have an effect on the slope. So you can uh, get an erroneous uh, reading of the mitral valve area. So uh, that is one area where you have to be careful in terms of an AR, which is more than significant, that is more than moderate, which can affect the, uh, the, the mitral valve area calculated by pressure of time. Now, when you look at the mitral regurgitation, 
the flow across the mitral valve. So you have a regurgitation, it goes from here and goes across. So what will happen is your gradients will increase. So it will affect more of gradients, but it will not affect your mitral valve area. So that is uh, something which you have to keep in mind. Okay, so you have gradients, which will be affected by my MR, and you have aortic regurgitation, which will affect the pressure of time uh, method calculation for mitral valve area. So this would be the uh, the, the continuous uh, wave Doppler. Now, which would you use, continuous wave Doppler or the pulse wave Doppler to get these gradients? Pulse wave Doppler. Okay, so uh, ideally you should always go for continuous wave Doppler. So any flow is stenotic, mitral stenosis, use continuous wave Doppler. If you want to choose pulse wave Doppler, uh, then always make sure that your sample is at the tip of the leaflet, so slightly beyond. So don't end up putting the sample below the leaflets here. It should be at the tip of the leaflet, so it should go a little beyond here. If you use pulse wave Doppler, but generally, by far, whenever you are uh, sampling the mitral stenosis, always use continuous wave Doppler. So now, uh, what do you think of this uh, 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 spectral Doppler here? What is your comment on this? Anybody? I found a solid base function. Sir, yes. there is associated diastolic MR. My noise. No, um, well, not MR, not diastolic MR. Uh, something related to somebody mentioned about diastolic function. So, what is that? Something related to diastolic function. Yeah, a wave is greater than E wave, sir. And then atrial reversal wave is also larger, sir. Well, uh, atrial reversal wave, you don't mention it here. Atrial reversal is a wave which you see in the pulmonary vein. So the atrial reversal and pulmonary vein sampling is what uh, would be the one. So here you don't comment about uh, atrial reversal. So in this uh, 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 spectral Doppler, when you compare with this, you have a E which is very tall and an A which is very small here, the, the last part of the profile here. But in this, it is the other way around. So in this uh, profile, what is being uh, sort of interpreted, what should be interpreted is that this is a mitral stenosis patient, but which has got an LV which has got impaired uh, relaxation of normality. So this is uh, diastolic dysfunction which is uh, playing a role and it is not allowing the early flow to happen and because of the stiff LV it has uh, caused this uh, early part of the flow to be less and then the atrial part is slightly more here. So this is nothing but mitral stenosis in a patient with uh, impaired relaxation of the left ventricle. So that would be the message here. Uh, then let's go to this one. So what method would you call call this in the assessment of mitral stenosis? Sir, in the presence of mitral stenosis, the uh, area can be increased because of mitral stenosis also, no, sir. If it is severe stenosis, it yes. may not reflect always the diastolic dysfunction. Yeah. What you're saying is correct, but what is happening here is here the LV is very sort of relaxed here. So there is no impairment of the uh, relaxation here. So as the flow is coming in, the LV starts to dilate here and relaxes nicely, allowing the flow to uh, get through into the left ventricle here. But in this particular patient, you have a left ventricle which is very stiff and uh, which has got impaired relaxation. So as the mitral valve opens here, so the flow is not happening. You would normally expect the E to be, uh, the early part to be higher and then the atrial part to be lower. So here the flow is not happening in the early part and because of that, it is going to be blunted. So this is the so-called E wave, if I have to call it. And the, uh, the last part of the flow, which is getting into the left ventricle that is uh, promoted, that is boosted by the atria is this part. 
So you have a lower sort of early part and then a taller uh, uh, last part. And this is suggestive of uh, a left ventricle, which is uh, stiff, which is uh, the compliance is not there, the relaxation is impaired, and that is the reason why this early flow is not happening. Is that okay? Okay, sir. Right. So what method would you call this in the assessment of mitral stenosis? Anybody? You must have heard of mitral leaflet separation index, right? Okay. So this is uh, again uh, not a very sort of uh, uh, sensitive one, especially when it comes to the lower degrees, uh, low severity of the mitral stenosis. It generally tends to work better in a more severe uh, mitral stenosis. So the principle behind this is that you look at the separation here in the parasonal long axis, measure the distance between this to this, and then uh, whatever you get, you take that value and then you go again, go to the four chamber here and do the same thing. And then you uh, take this uh, average here and then uh, you look at the value. So if it is uh, around uh, uh, less than uh, eight uh, millimeters. So the uh, mitral stenosis is going to be severe. So this is a qualitative approach, and uh, uh, but it has published data and uh, it has also come from the Indian data also. So this is something which you should be knowing. And I, when if there is a question, you can answer it or otherwise uh, it can be useful sometimes when you have, uh, uh, when you want to do a quick uh, sort of an assessment or when there is a mitral regurgitation and for so many reasons you may not be able to do the Doppler for some reason. So especially during post-PTMC, immediate during the cath lab uh, uh, on table, you can use this as a rough uh, qualitative sort of uh, estimation. So this method is called as mitral leaflet separation index. Eight millimeters less severe, more than 10 millimeters is mined. Then let me go to the, another method here. So this is the continuity equation. So when can you use the continuity equation? Anybody? Uh, no VSD, no AST should be there. No regurgitation. Okay. So this uh, is something which you can use. For example, uh, let us say that uh, your uh, uh, planimetry is not workable. For some reason, the image is not good. The quality of the image is not good. Your planimetry is not very reliable. So then you can use this as an alternate way of uh, uh, looking at the mitral valve area here. And uh, you uh, provide mitral regurgitation. So the principle is again the same here. So you look at the stroke volume across the LVOT and then you divide it by the mitral valve stenotic VTI here. So this is the continuity equation. So we can use it when the planimetry is not uh, workable and uh, you, to, uh, you can always have uh, a flow issue in terms of uh, mitral regurgitation. Uh, uh, what about PISA? How, uh, uh, when can you use the PISA? When the jet of the jet is central jet, sir, not eccentric. Okay. Uh, that is uh, especially in MR mitral regurgitation, sir. Oh. So this is method which is more theoretical, which hardly anybody ever practices and which is difficult to do but it is part of your uh, the sort of a theory where you will be asked about what are the various methods. So this is uh, something where you cannot do the continuity equation because the mitral regurgitation can use the PISA in uh, that sort of a theoretical scenario. So uh, what I have shown you is the various ways of trying to 
uh, assess the severity of mitral stenosis. So we looked at uh, the M mode, then we looked at uh, 2D planimetry, pressure of time, uh, pipe pressure of time, looking at the mitral valve area, and then looked at the gradients, how we can use gradients as a way of uh, assessing, and then how gradients can be affected in terms of increased flow like mitral regurgitation, or it can be affected when there is uh, LV compliance issues. And then you have these uh, uh, this qualitative test where you can uh, use the mitral leaflet separation index. And then uh, when situations where you cannot do these above methods, you have the continuity equation. And then PISA is more a theoretical, uh, but you should be aware of it that it is another test which has uh, which is there in published uh, literature. Now, uh, 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 tell me the uh, what is the difference between uh, uh, this uh, valve and uh, the between image A and image B. So I'll show you image A. So watch closely. Just look at the mitral valve, nothing else. And uh, now I'm going to run image B. So what is the difference between the two? Again, I'm going to do it. So image A and image B. Sir, in image A, both leaflets are uh, thickened. There is a restrictive movement of the leaflets. Okay. And in image B, uh, anterior mitral leaflet is uh, prolapsed. Prolapse is there and there is increased uh, leaflet motion. So that is the point. So that is what I am trying to convey. So this is uh, the one which has got uh, excessive mobility. Would you? Wouldn't you? Would you like to say excessive mobility? So how would that translate into your auscultation? This excessive mobility. And what is that word which can be used for this? Sorry. Oh, opening snap. Opening snap. Will be opening snap. So this is a very pliable valve. Okay. So there is a, it's a pliable valve and then it is related to your opening snap here. Yes. So uh, this is the one which is does not have that excessive movement. So. Now uh, uh, make a comment of this image. There are many findings, so you can keep coming up with. There's thickening of the AML and the PML, okay. and there's calcification uh, in the lateral commission. Right. The aspects of calcification in the AML also seen, and in PML also seen. Right. And the PML is uh, immobile; it is not moving at all. AML is one which is moving. Okay. So, as you said, the main finding here is that there is a commercial calcification. So, that is the important point. So, uh, when you see something like this, immediately say that there is commercial calcification. And of course, as you said, this is the anterolateral commissure and then this is the posteromedial commissure. So, there is commercial calcification here. And in addition, just for the sake of uh, you know, completion of how to interpret this image. You can see these small sort of uh, specks of calcium here. This is outside. So this is the posterior mitral annulus, which is sort of uh, 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 calcified in a very small manner. And then there's part of the anterior mitral annulus also, which is calcified here. So, but the main message here is there is a commercial calcification. So how would you sort of describe commercial calcifications a little more? Can you sort of put in a little more description into your commercial calcification? Anybody? So unilateral or bilateral commercial calcification? Right. So there is... Um, uh, you know, unilateral unicommercial calcification. Now, uh, the what I'm trying to sort of again uh, give you some incremental information is that you need to look at the commercial calcification more closely. So look at the calcification in terms of how much it is affecting the commercial. 
is this uh, free of ca calcium or is there calcium and which commissure and if it is there in that commissure is it the entire commissure or is it the uh, only part of the commissure so for this you need to angulate your uh, uh, the short axis a little bit back and forth because you generally find it difficult to get the uh, both the commissures at the same level so you may need to tilt the probe uh, in uh, a different angle but what you need to observe in this uh, is that is it partial or is it complete uh, calcification or is it both commissures and is there a possibility that part of it is uh, still not calcified here so this can be sort of useful to you not just for the examination but also in terms of uh, when you're doing your ptmc's to find out uh, can you sort of go ahead with the uh, ballooning so uh, this would be to look at the uh, calcification. Now, uh, uh, again, so, uh, just, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, uh, this uh, commercial calcification grading, so uh, up to what grading we can take for PTMC or we cannot take at all if there's any calcification? This is not a guideline or an expert document uh, grading. So this is a published one. Uh, I would not really focus too much on the grading uh, but as far as publication is concerned, you should be able to know. But when you are going to use it for a general use, it has still not come into the uh, expert document. So there is no need to really sort of uh, uh, focus too much on the grading. So the description would be much more important, whether uh, one commissure, and if it is one commissure, whether it is a complete commissure or whether it is half the commissure. So grading, I would say that, you know, uh, you can... Uh, uh, sort of uh, not just be aware of it, but you need not have to sort of state it. If it comes to a discussion, you can talk about it, but not in a, a routine uh, general purpose. You don't generally use it. It is just in this particular publication, which they have nicely elucidated, but uh, it does still not come into the mainstream, the, the expert documents. Okay. All right. Okay. So okay. now. Uh, sort of, uh, okay, you have this image now. So give me your observations. What do you see in uh, this image? This is not a bad image. This is not a good image. It's an average image. And uh, these are the ones which you can leave and come there is a thickening of uh, intermetal leaflet and postermetal leaflet with immobile postermetal leaflet. Okay. And there is a thick before of the subalbar. Before that, let's start with the thickening itself. So when you say thickening, uh, it's always uh, good to say where the thickening is. Of course, you need to have uh, the personal long axis view also. So your thickening should be uh, sort of precise in terms of whether it is the margin or whether it is the middle leaflet or whether it is the entire leaflet. That is as far as thickening is concerned. Next, uh, uh, what was the other finding you said? Uh, the PML is immobile, sir. PML is immobile. Okay. That is uh, uh, first you mentioned about thickness. Now your comment is about mobility, right? Yes, so that is the second uh, important point in terms of describing the valve. So first you said about thickness. Now we are talking about mobility. So when you talk about mobility, it is better that you start with the AML, which is the main leaflet which we are concerned about. So what would you, how do you describe the AML? Uh, AML, uh, the whole AML is uh, rest, uh, has uh, restricted mobility, but it is all the uh, all the thirds. Like the pro you see, usually say the proximal, middle, and distal thirds, like that you say, okay. all are mobile. So it is doming, primal doming. So what you're saying is, except for the margins, rest of the, the base and mid are moving. Okay, yes. so there is some amount of doming. Okay. PML is immobile, so that is fine. So mobility we are done. Next is calcification. So I know it is not very really, uh, sort of clear, but you know it's everything looks bright. But just make a comment about calcification. Uh, there are some hyporechoic spots at the margins, sir. Maybe there is some calcification on the PML and PML. Oh. I'm saying. So, is it a single spec or is it multiple specs? Multiple specs. Oh, so you should talk like that. So when you describe 
the valve, so the thickness, and then you have the mobility, then you talk about calcification, you should say that I see no calcification, or I see single spec, or I see multiple specs, or I see calcification extending, uh, involving the entire leaflet or the you know the the margins of the leaflet or the mid leaflet. So uh, be a little more sort of uh, 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 in terms of being precise as far as where the calcium is. So that would be the calcium. So the last one, what is the other uh, important finding which you need to describe? You mentioned. So the uh, apparatus uh, is uh, so, uh, Okay. All the, so you the entire body appears to be thickened. Thick right, right, right. So there is some significant subvalvular shortening, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So that would be the description roughly of what we can assess from this particular view of the mitral valve. Now, what do you think of the left atrium? Left atrium is dilated. Dilated. Uh, Okay, it's 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 done thing. It's a given thing. So here, interesting thing is, look at the left atrium. It's the long axis which is dilated more than the uh, uh, the medial atrium. So this is how the left atrium sort of you know dilates in uh, different people. So left atrial dilatation. So important thing apart from left atrial dilatation is that do you see a thrombus or not? Right. So you have to make a comment and say yes, no, or maybe positive, something like that. And what uh, is the, the usual, yeah, sis? The LA cavity is not showing in thrombus, but the LA appendage is not well seen, so I can't okay. comment on the LA appendage. Okay, where would you uh, see the LA appendage in this particular view? Give me a rough uh, sort of uh, direction. Where would the LA appendage be visible in the fourth chamber. You are correct, but let's uh, get the anatomic location of the left atrial appendage. Uh, it will be slightly and uh, it will be uh, below the left superior pulmonary vein, uh, just above the metal angles. But we have the uh, fourth chamber here. So this is the posterior mitral leaflet. So what you do is that you need to focus at this area here. The left atrial appendage generally is a little more difficult to see in the fourth chamber view. And this is the point where the left atrial appendage is seen. And as you said, below that would be the left uh, superior pulmonary vein. So the left atrial appendage, the best view is always going to be the short axis. Next would be the two chamber view, which is the next best view. And the third is this where it is a little more difficult compared to the other views. So this is the left atrial appendage. So uh, we don't see the left atrial appendage. So I wouldn't make a comment here, but definitely the body of the left atrium does not have anything. So I will say no a thrombus here. Now, what do you think of the left ventricle here? So characteristic feature of the left ventricle in microstenosis. Not under so small, under small cavity. Underfilled, small LV. That is the one. And uh, there is one very subtle sort of finding, which is uh, something which, uh, you know, if you are uh, really got sharp eyes, can you tell me some other finding which is uh, also going to be Septal important? PFO. Septal PFO. PFO. Stretch PFO. PFO, okay. I mean, until and unless I put a color. I will not be able to confirm it. Somebody said something. PBMB septal. PBMB status. Sorry. Uh, septal. Post PBMB status, sir. Septal discontinuity is there. Uh, okay, maybe. But uh, anything else? Any other? Have you noticed the septal leaflet here, the tricuspid valve? In between, as it sort of goes back and forth, there is some thickening and there is some minimal doming here. OK, so make sure that you do not miss a tricuspid pathology when you are looking at mitral stenosis. There is very commonly what happens is you tend to get focused on the mitral valve. It is very obvious. You see everything here and in your uh, hurry, you might not observe the tricuspid valve also. So this thickening and a little bit of doming uh, is uh, the uh, involvement of the tricuspid valve. So be very careful about not missing tri tricuspid valve, uh, uh, primary tricuspid valve pathology in uh, th this sort of a scenario. 
Okay, so just uh, let's look at the uh, uh, score here. So this is the Wilkins score, and this is uh, something which is very uh, commonly uh, available, commonly discussed. And the numbers uh, you have to be remembering as far as thickening is concerned is that five millimeters or less normal, and between five and eight and more than five and eight, the severity of the score increases. And then anything more than eight is really bad. And calcification, single area, scattered area, and extending into the mid, and then uh, throughout much of the leaflet tissue. This is the calcification. And the subvalvular, just below one third, two thirds, and then extending up to the papillary muscle. So this is the subvalvular. And then mobility, you have that highly pliable, excessive mobility uh, valve here, highly mobile valve. And then you have this hardly any movement. Uh, this is the other extreme. Now, uh, can you tell me something about the Wilkins score? How would you use it? If it, it is, is a, a more than eight. Okay, more than eight. What does it mean? It's the valve is not uh, amenable for PTMC. Uh, okay, um, you are partly correct, but can you be a little more precise? Less than eight PTMC possible, more than twelve uh, or not possible. Eight to twelve, you have to individualize. So generally, you're looking at the outcome of your PTMC, right? So if it is less than 8, the outcome is going to be good. If it is between 8 and 12, as you said, the outcome is moderate. Anything more than 12, the outcome is going to be bad. So it is not uh, uh, an indication to do PTMC. So you're primarily looking at the outcomes in terms of what will happen in terms of success, in terms of... Uh, uh, the uh, the complications that can occur. So that is what you are interested in. And this is where the Wilkins score gives you a clue as to how to sort of assess the mitral pad. Now, what is the limitation of Wilkins score? This is another question that is asked. Commercial calcification is not included. Right. Then? LA thrombus of sick. LA thrombus, right? Mitral okay. regurgitation. Mitral is regurgitation. So uh, be aware of uh, these uh, queries that will come to you as to why uh, Wilkins score is not an ideal score and uh, uh, what uh, has happened over the last few years in terms of making it a better score now. What uh, new sort of uh, approach has there been now? Use of 3D echo. 3D. So 3D, 3D, 3D score, cornea score is there, sir, which considers a commercial calcification. Cornea score is different. So the 3D has been uh, not again come into the expert documents, but it is uh, published data. So it is uh, again a bit of a discussion sort of a topic where uh, it has been helpful in terms of looking at the subvalvular and uh, uh, to some extent, looking at the uh, commercial calcification involvement, the commercial involvement. No. So that is where the 3D is. So there is some advantage of using 3D, but it is still not coming to the expert documents. So coming to Cormier score. So uh, you mentioned about Cormier score. So this is Cormier score. So Cormier score is primarily looking at the pliability, looking at the calcification, and basically looking at the length of the cord. So if it is a thin cordae, more than 10 millimeters, it is in group one. So this is a better score. And you have a thickened cordae, but here there is shortening that has happened because it has become thickened. It has lost its tensile strength and now it is shortened. So here it is less than 10 millimeters. So here the score is starting to worsen. So the worst is group three. This score is where you have calcification and uh, uh, this is to whatever extent, and uh, this again is whatever the state of subvalvular. So this is the Cormier score, so not widely used, but then again, this is a discussion point, uh, which you should be sort of at least be able to uh, talk about what are the main parameters that are used and how you sort of score it. Okay. 
So that would be the Cormier score. So Wilkins score, Cormier score. Now, uh, uh, what is the, uh, how would you uh, describe this? It's a transesophageal echo, sir. Right. 130 degree, 130 degree angle. Right. Uh, left atrium, mitral valve, and left ventricle. And uh, there is a uh, severe stenosis of mitral valve with the doming of uh, AML. And okay. Thickening of uh, both the leaflets. And uh, dilated left atrium with uh, spontaneous echo contrast was there in the left atrium, sir. Perfect. Okay, so that's a very nice uh, description of how you should analyze this image. Now, the next question obviously will be, uh, what, is, uh, what is the grading of SEC? How do you grade SEC? Mm, sir, uh, 0, 1 plus and 2 plus, sir. Um, okay. 0, uh, there is no smoke. 1 plus is uh, mild smoke visible in some portion of LA. 2 plus is uh, dense mode that appear throughout the LAC. Oh, okay, slight uh, sort of uh, modification to that. Zero, you are correct. The grade one sec is where you see intermittent sec, right? You don't see it continuously. You see it on and off. That is the first point. Second point is to see this sec, you have to do some noise adjustments. You have to increase the gain. So when you do this and you, when you see sec, it is called as grade one. When you say it is uh, moderate or grade 2 sec, there you don't have to do any adjustment. And uh, the sec is you easily visible and it is continuous. You see it throughout the uh, cardiac cycle. So that would be grade 2 sec. And uh, grade 3 sec or uh, again uh, uh, the grade 4 uh, it sort of overlaps is that when you have, uh, uh, it is more of a subjective assessment. Dense sec is grade 4 and severe sec they say in grade 3. So that means you see sec throughout uniformly distributed looking very bright. So this uh, image is to convey to you as to how you should look at sec and how you can grade sec. Is it okay? Understanding of sec and okay. grading? Okay, sir. Right. Then uh, what about this? What is uh, the interpretation? What is the comment? What is the finding? Uh, this is a T, sir, uh, showing a uh, uh, LA appendage velocity pulse wave Doppler, sir, okay. and showing the waves, sir. Uh, huh. uh, uh, Normally, the LA appendage velocity uh, range uh, lies between 50 to 100 uh, centimeter per second, sir. But here we can see the velocity of the waves is uh, decreased, sir. Okay. So mm -hmm. here again, I will uh, add to what you told. So when you talk about LA velocity, you have to say that it is an emptying velocity or a filling velocity. So uh, what is this velocity here? one which I'm pointing here. You're able to see it, right? Emptying velocity. emptying velocity. This is the velocity which we are concerned about, the emptying velocity. This is reflective of the left atrial appendage contractile function. The more the left atrial appendage contracts, the higher will be the emptying velocity. So here, what is the cutoff uh, for this? To say that the left atrial appendage is you know, doing well, less likely for a, a thrombus to happen. The less it contracts, more likely that there is a thrombus which is going to happen over there. So when do we say that it is uh, you know, normal? Sir, uh, emptying velocity is uh, 50 to 100, sir, uh, uh, centimeter per second. Okay, somewhere around 40, 50, so depending on which literature you source. So I generally take it as 40 to 50. So anything less than 40, definitely it is reduced. Anything less than 20, uh, in this particular patient, you can see that this is the 20th mark and it is really bad here. So this is uh, uh, significantly severely reduced. So the 
cutoff value which you should remember is around 40 to 50. So that would be the emptying velocity. And this is the filling velocity which we are not really concerned about. Okay, so this would be the uh, left atrial appendage velocity and uh, what is the how to interpret and uh, what are the waves which you see here. Now, uh, any questions uh, on this? Shall I move on? Uh, sir, can you describe the waves once again, sir? Okay, so just focus on these two waves. So you have the P wave here. Now, uh, this is the point where the P electrical P wave is here. So the, uh, uh, then what happens is the atria contracts here. And that means even the appendage contracts because you're sampling here. What you see here is the uh, appendage sampling here. So at this point it is contracting. So when this contracts, the flow which is inside the left atrial appendage goes towards the probe. So this is going to be a red flow when you put on color. And when you put it on Doppler, this is going to be a positive wave. So it is emptying itself. It is contracting and it is throwing out the flow here. So this is the emptying velocity. Now at this point here, uh, the systole starts. So during systole, LA starts to act as a reservoir. And this is where the filling starts to happen. And this is the filling velocity here. So this point, this is the filling velocity. Emptying velocity, filling velocity. So this is after the QRS. This is where the systole starts at this point. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. Now, uh, tell me the role of... Space, uh, sir. Sorry? Yeah, okay, tell me, tell me. Two waves in the filling, two waves in the filling no, sir? Which yeah, the early waves? and the late uh, uh, filling is there, but generally focus on the uh, the early part. Okay. This is the filling. But primarily, our focus always, always has been the emptying velocity here. What is the... Uh, 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 Incidence of uh, thrombus in a patient with mitosinosis in valvular and non-valvular. Uh, let's I'll put it this way: non-valvular and RHD mitosinosis. Thrombus happening. What percentage from the thrombus uh, appendage? Thrombus happens in non-valvular AF and in well, uh, RHD, if any non valvular, it will be around 2%, sir. In valvular, it is around 18, 18%, sir. It is quite high, in fact. So you have a higher, yeah, almost up to close to around uh, in non valvular, it's almost up to around 90%. That's how high it is in uh, atrial fibrillation. So here again, uh, in uh, the RHD, it is about 60%. And when there is an AF in uh, rheumatic heart disease, mitosinosis, if there's a thrombus, you have uh, if there's the atrial fibrillation, you have almost 60% of uh, the thrombus forming in the left atrial appendage. And uh, you have a short duration. It is, I think, if I remember, it is less than 10%. If it is less than three days old AF, it is of chronic duration, it is about 25 to 30 percent in rheumatic heart disease. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, can you repeat, sir? We didn't get that. So, non valvular uh, AF, uh, the LA thrombus uh, uh, from the AF appendage incidence, uh, the percentage will be more. Uh, Quite. LA appendage thrombus, uh, it will be more, sir, compared to Quite. valvular. Valvular. Sir. Compared to valvular RHDMS. Oh, oh, okay, sir. Okay. Oh. So now uh, let me come to uh, uh, stress echo in mitosinosis. What can you tell me about stress echo? Whether it Audited. is a long question, whether it is a short question, discussion, something about stress echo in mitosinosis. Yeah, sir. when there is a discrepancy so, between the symptoms uh, as well as the uh, mitral severity of mitral stenosis, so we have to address stress, uh, sir. 
Oh, which stress echo would you choose from? Sir, so, uh, can uh, depending on the exercise, um, whether he can do uh, exercise, sir, or we can do pharmacological stress also. Right. So ideally, it is going to be exercise stress echo. And uh, for some reason, uh, if uh, exercise is not possible, then it is going to be dobutamine stress echo. So rather than pharmacological, it is dobutamine, which is more validated. So you can use the word dobutamine stress echo. So this is a patient who underwent dobutamine stress echo. So now what is the cutoff for mean gradient to say that uh, uh, this is a significant MS and uh, something has to be done in uh, dobutamine stress echo? More Going than 15, on. sir. Uh, in dobutamine stress echo, the cutoff as far as mean gradient is concerned is 18 millimeters of mercury. If you are using exercise stress echo, it is slightly lower. It is 15. And the PA pressure should be more than 60 in whether it is exercise or dobutamine. Okay. Are you okay with this? Exercise 15, sir. Exercise 15, a mean gradient of 15 and more. While for yes. butamine stress echo, it is 18 millimeters of mercury mean gradient, 18 or more. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Right. So you have to read more about the uh, role of stress echo in mitral stenosis. That is the reason why this slide has been included. And uh, just to sort of uh, you know finish off with mitral stenosis, uh, uh, this is uh, a view which you are aware. So where mitral, the 3D helps us, it gives you better understanding of mitral valve morphology. Com issues are much better seen. You see it in the same plane. In 2D, you don't see the com issues in the short axis uh, to of the uh, left ventricle looking at the mitral valve. Uh, they don't occur at the same plane. So then it's a problem as far as looking at the valve area is concerned. But when it comes to 3D, that is where this uh, disadvantage is overcome. Uh, so you have better understanding of valve morphology, better look at the commissures uh, and the orifice also the irregularity and the presence of calcification. As you can see here that there's a small area of calcification and uh, in uh, complex mitral valve stenosis. That means you have an asymmetrical orifice, which is not easy to do a planimetry. The role of 3D is important. So that is where 3D comes in. So otherwise, generally 3D for my MVA is not really required. So uh, just bringing in briefly about how to look at uh, what is the role of 3D as far as mitral stenosis is concerned. So now let's move on to the other lesion. So quickly now. So uh, this is the short axis. So if I have to look at the leaflet, so this is the anterior mitral leaflet. This is the posterior mitral leaflet. So which side would be uh, the uh, segment one and which side would be the segment three? So what segments will come here? Let me put the arrow here. What segments will come here? This is PML. This is AML. Three. Yeah. Three, sir. P3. So this is uh, A3, P3, tricuspid valve comes here. So and this appendage comes here. So this will be A1 and P1. And this is A2, A2 P2. So this is how you should be looking at A1, P1, A2, P2, A3, P3, anterolateral commissure, posteromedial commissure. So that is as far as segmentation is concerned. Now, this uh, particular slide, which I'm going to show, already has uh, the annotation. So I'll just run you through how you can look at the various segments. So I'm now going into regurgitant lesions. So you need to look at the scallops more carefully. So when you have a regular uh, parasol long axis, so this is going to be A2, P2. That is the, uh, those are the two segments you're going to hit when you have a good parasternal long axis, ideal parasternal long axis. Now, when you tilt the parasternal long axis and make the aortic valve bigger, so that is when it becomes A1, P1. So that means you are sort of uh, tilting the transducer more cranially, where you want to, uh, you end up seeing a bigger, uh, more prominent aortic valve, then uh, automatically these two segments 
are now going to be A1, P1. So aortic valve A1, P1. Now, when you tilt it the other way, when you go towards the uh, feet, that is uh, uh, caudally, and you start to see a little bit of the tricuspid valve, so that means you get to see the A3, P3. So this is in parasternal long axis. So A1, uh, A2, P2 is the one which you normally see. A1 is uh, towards aortic valve and A3 is towards tricuspid valve. And this we have already seen. So in the apical four chamber view, generally you see, uh, you're always going to see A2, P2. So uh, this, uh, I think you can ignore, it can be confusing. So again, I will just say it is going to be A2, P2 here. Now the, the third view, which is of importance is where it is again asked is the commercial view. So what are the segments seen in the commercial view? You see three parts of the leaflet. So this is the, uh, the, the two chamber view here, and you have the anterior wall and the inferior wall here. So towards the anterior wall, you have the P1 here. So this is uh, one bit of leaflet segment you see, and then you see a small segment bobbing or you know, coming back and forth. So this is going to be A2 here, and towards the inferior wall, uh, is going to be the P3. So always remember commercial view segments P1, A2, P3. P1, A2, P3. So this you have to remember. So I'm trying to keep it simple. It is uh, very confusing. So pass along axis A2, P2, epical four chamber generally A2, P2, and uh, the commercial view in the two chamber view P1, A2, P3. Is that okay? It is just a one slide, you know, information about how to look at segments. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. So now, uh, uh, how would you describe this MR? The direction of the flow. Is it a, a central MR? Centrally directed? Eccentric. Okay, so there is some amount of uh, eccentricity, but uh, uh, if I have to tell you uh, that it is a central jet and you see a uh, central MR, so what does it uh, tell you? What is, where is the mechanism? Why is that MR, where is it, uh, the, why is that MR occurring at uh, what part of the mitral valve that has caused this problem? Sir, with a2, P2. Uh, no, I wouldn't uh, talk about the segments. I'm talking about the mitral <coughs> apparatus. Is it at yes. what level? Yes. Is it at the leaflet level? Is it at the uh, annular level? Uh, annular uh, level, uh, sir. We can see the con contractility is less. Uh, so I think it's more of a due to annular dilatation. Is it, oh. sir? So the uh, again, the message here is that if you see a centrally directed jet, always think possibly it is an annular dilatation. Of course, you have to correlate with the LV size or sometimes even the uh, left atrium can cause, uh, isolated left atrial uh, enlargement can also cause this. So centrally directed jets, generally the cause is annular dilatation. Okay, now uh, what is the cause for this? This is not central. This is an eccentric jet. So when you see this, which, where is the pathology here? So, Romantic. PML. It is PML. leaflet. Correct. It is a leaflet, yes, a leaflet. pathology. Rup rupture of the... It course. can be rupture, it can be prolapse, it can be flail. But primarily, when you see uh, a jet which is going anteriorly, this is a long axis. So this is the anterior uh, aspect, and this is posterior, right? So this is anterior, this is posterior. So in the long axis, when the jet goes like this anteriorly, so the pathology usually is a problem in the posterior mitral leaflet. Are you okay with that? Anterior jet, it is the contralateral leaflet which is involved. That is the PML. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. 
Right. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Now, what is the problem here? Which leaflet is involved? AML. 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 So this is an example of a posteriorly directed jet. So if it is going posteriorly, so there is a pathology in the anterior mitral leaflet. So it is the contralateral uh, leaflet in direction of the jet. Are you okay? So anterior mitral leaflet, uh, so anterior, uh, anterior jet, and then this is the posterior jet. Now, what is the uh, problem here? There's MR. There's, there's MR. And what direction is the jet? Posterior direction. Posterior. Fine. So what do you think? Which leaflet is involved? Here it is. PML is involved. Okay. So this is a different pathology here. What is that which is different here? Ischemia. Yes, posterior. Exactly, exactly. So please remember Secondary. that you can have a posterior jet and uh, the, when there is an involvement of the posterior wall. So you can see that this is an akinetic, almost severely hyperkinetic posterior wall. So what happens here is that there is tethering of the posterior mitral leaflet here. So this leaflet gets pulled and then because of that there is a gap generally at the P3 point and that is why you get a posteriorly directed jet. So usually just to summarize usually an anteriorly directed jet is because of posterior mitral leaflet prolapse while a posteriorly directed jet is due to an anterior mitral leaflet prolapse. So that is the usual thumb rule. But when you have an ischemic MR, the posterior directed jet is not because of any leaflet issues, because of any prolapse. It is primarily because if it is a tethered uh, posterior mitral leaflet. Is that okay? Yes, yes. sir. Okay. So now... What do you see here? There are multiple jets. Multiple jets. So you have one which is going anterior and then one which is going posterior. So this is a multiple, a multi centric jet. Now, uh, what about this? There is a perforation in the AML. Exactly. exactly. So the reason why you are seeing perforation is this is the main orifice. So this is where the leaflets are coapting and you don't see much of flow coming through this. So what you're seeing here is a flow which is coming almost perpendicular to this leaflet. So there is a perforation which has uh, happened and because of that you get a jet which is coming almost perpendicular and in the body of the leaflet and what is very very important is that it is away from the uh, orifice so that tells you that this is a perforation so what are the common causes for perforation infective endocarditis yeah. and also yeah. any transcutaneous yeah. procedure like a ptmc ptms okay so now, what is this? What is, what is being shown here? It's a zoom view. I will give you, you know, additional information. It's a epical four chamber view. So it is across the mitral valve. But what is that color jet which has been frozen and being shown to you? For what purpose? For measuring pizza. Uh, Severity, sir. It is a Vena contractor. Vena contractor. Sorry. It has been a contractor. So this is now, uh, all along I was showing you images to show the direction of the jet. So now I'm moving into quantification, how to quantify severity of mitral regurgitation. So as you said, this is the vena contractor taken in the epical four chamber view. So here you can see that a vena contractor, well, how do you define vena contractor? 
site of origin of jet mm. arrows narrowest portion Okay, narrowest portion, portion, portion of the jet. Narrowest portion of the jet. That is the most important thing. What is the advantage of being a contractor? Why is it sort of recommended that it should be used? But it indicates the severity, sir. Uh, yeah, it is used as a parameter to assess severity. But I'm telling, you know, I'm asking a question. There is being a contractor. I'm telling this is a much better method to assess severity. Why is it better? Objectively quantify the severity. Much more reproducibility. Okay, so um, better reproducibility. Uh, anything more than that? Okay, so I what? Could say lay pressures and all. Yes, yes, yes. So that is the point here. So it is not going to be affected by the flow rate here. It doesn't matter how high or how, how low the flow rate is. This will not vary. Okay. So that is the most important thing. And it is not going to be affected by the pressure on this side or pressure on this side. So the driving pressure, so to speak. So that is the greatest advantage of in a contractor where it is not affected by the flow going across the, the orifice, related in orifice, nor is it going to be affected by the pressures, especially the driving force pressure. So that will not be affected. And uh, uh, as you said, it is the narrowest portion. It is just below the uh, anatomical orifice. So if this is the anatomical orifice, the mean contractor will be just below this. And it is always going to be smaller than the anatomical orifice. And for a good vena contractor, you need to have a good hemisphere, you need to have a neck, and you have to have a divergence of the flow. So that is the other thing. When you're doing a vena contractor, make sure that you have a good uh, sort of uh, hemisphere at this point here, the convergence here, not hemisphere, convergence, and a small, good, nice neck, which can be delineated using the zoom. And then you have the divergence of the flow as it enters into the left HM. So that is important. Now, what method is this? Jet area methods. Uh, jet area method and uh, what more? Jet area to LA area. LA area. So there are two methods here. So you have uh, a method which looks only at the constant fraction, and, and then you have the left area, left atrial area also. So left uh, jet area method is one. The second is left atrium, uh, the jet area and the left atrial area uh, ratio of that. So two methods are here. here. And uh, what is the problem here? Why? Sh uh, what is the weakness of this method? The jet area can be overestimated easily, sir. Yes. So it is affected to a large extent by gain. It is affected by the driving force. It is affected by the orifice area. Multiple uh, reasons why this uh, jet area is uh, sort of uh, limited. So that is the reason why, though it is in the list of uh, parameters to look at severity of MR, this is not widely used so you should know the pros and cons the cons are more actually so that is those are the limitations now uh, uh, what is being shown here spectral density okay so what doppler is this continuous wave. continuous doppler so this is another method to assess severity of mr looking at continuous wave doppler so how would you uh, Describe this. What is it? Severe MR? Is it what sort of MR is this? Severe I MR. Sorry. Severe. Severe MR, sir. Severe MR. Oh, well, actually, it is mild MR. Why? Look at the density. This is the forward flow across the mitral valve. When you have a density of the mitral uh, regurgitation less than the forward flow, it is mild MR. Okay, and when this density reaches the same as that of the forward flow, then it is severe uh, moderate MR. When the density of this is more than the forward flow, that means it is severe MR. So it is a very qualitative one, but again, it is uh, widely used, uh, but very low down on the list. So this is looking at the density of the jet. Is that okay? Fine. So how would also you? Shape. Yeah. Sorry. Also, shape uh, triangle is more. I'll, dense. Come to that. I'll come to that. 
you are correct. Now, how do you describe this image? It's an MR jet. And system or parabolic shape. Yeah. So that is the description of an MR jet. So it is going to be parabolic like this. It, the shape is parabolic. And usually MR jet is always more than four meters, provided the LV function is good. So it is going to be a high velocity jet. So th the question that will be asked is how do you know it is MR? You should say that it has got a parabolic uh, shape here. And then you have a very high velocity, usually more than four. And then when the MR starts, it usually starts very early. So it starts during the isovolumic phase. It is, and then it continues for a long time and then ends in the isovolumic relaxation phase. So it involves both the isovolumic phase. So it's got a very long duration. So that would be the MR. And also when you look at MR, you should also say whether it is a, a hollow systolic MR or whether it is late systolic or mid to late systolic MR. Where do you get mid to late systolic MR? Critical prolapse. Oh. MVP. 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 Now coming to this, as you said earlier. So what does this indicate now? This particular image. You somebody mentioned, made a comment. Dense so and triangular. Yes, so this is severe MR. You have this triangular shape which is peaking here. So that is because of the high LA pressure here. So you have the jet which is truncated here. So this would be uh, severe MR in favor of uh, severe MR and uh, also indicative of uh, very high LA pressure. So this is looking at continuous Doppler, looking at the severity. How do you assess severity? Looking at density forward flow and then looking at the, uh, the how dense it is and features of MR, what are the characteristic features of MR I showed you and then this uh, triangular shaping uh, MR which is indicative of uh, severe MR. Now the next parameter I'm going to move to is looking at pulse Doppler. So what does this indicate here, this pulse Doppler? So let me sort of focus only on this. Now between this image and this image, the top image and the bottom image, which is more severe? Ignore the bottom this image. image. Bottom image is more severe. More severe. So why do you say that? You are correct. Increased E velocities. Increased uh, E velocities. So here the cutoff is 1.2 to 1.5 meters. So more the flow across the mitral valve, more severe the MR, higher the flow will be across the uh, mitral valve. So when you put a pulse Doppler, you get a very high E wave here. So you generally uh, say that if it is more than 1.2 to 1.5 meters, that the MR is severe. So in a patient like this, where it is more like a grade one diastolic function, so dysfunction, so this is likely to be less than uh, severe, severe MR here. So this is use of pulse wave Doppler looking at the severity of MR looking at E velocity more than 1.2 meters per second indicates severe MR. So we are still with uh, how to assess severity of MR. Now what is this here? What sampling has been done? What pulmonary venous, pulmonary venous waves? Pulmonary waves. So how can you use pulmonary waves to assess severity of MR? Systolic reversal. No reversal. Right. So you have the S wave here. You have the D here. And as somebody mentioned a long time ago, so atrial reversal occurs here. So this is the atrial reversal wave. So atrial reversal occurs in pulmonary vein sampling. So you have the S wave here, D wave here. So this is mild or in a normal person. So as the severity of MR increases, you have the S wave which will get lesser and lesser and the D which will become higher. And at some point there is going to be reversal of the S wave. So you can see here. So this is the S wave and this is the D wave here. So you can see that this is suggestive of severe MR. So pulmonary vein sampling and use of it to look at severity of MR. Now, if, uh, uh, more or less have come to my last few slides. So this is just uh, one more. So to 
uh, if you can remember so regurgitated volume is also you know sometimes uh, asked so you should know at least uh, that regurgitation volume can be measured and if it is there anything more than 60 ml is severe here so just to sort of summarize how to uh, quantify mr qualitative methods jet area holosystolic that is uh, uh, throughout systole semi quantitative methods vena contractor pulse doppler systolic blunting in pulmonary veins when you want to be very quantitative and uh, what are the methods that will be asked you should say regurgitant volume regurgitant fraction and then of course the pisa the uh, effective regurgitant orifice area and then combine it with any structural involvement in terms of mitral valve morphology like a leaflet prolapse or a, a leaflet uh, um, a flail leaflet so that would be the one and uh, just to tell you how what are the factors that can affect mr heart rate can affect blood pressure can affect rhythm and also medications especially the common complaint is what you see in transthoracic when they go to ot on table the mr comes down that is because of the loading effect and then difficulties in assessing mr when you have multiple jets eccentric jets uh, th this is where the issue is going to be so this is just a summary of how you can assess uh, uh, mr so uh, this is uh, just a brief overview of how to assess mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation so uh, i think i can i shall stop at this point uh, any questions on whatever we have discussed uh, so is there any absolute jet area cut off for severe mr absolute jet area cut off for severe jet MR. area it is somewhere around uh, 10 cm squared more than that is severe uh, sir uh, about vena contracta does it hold uh, the same significance for both primary and secondary mr a uh, good question so since you have gone into primary and secondary mr so that is another question that i thought i'll keep it later but i'll anyway i'll discuss it now so it's very important that you should know uh, the uh mrs and secondary mrs so um so when you look at primary mrs you have uh, these are the uh, primary mrs and then you have the secondary mrs and uh, here the severity is relatively fixed in the secondary mr the severity is highly variable highly dynamic and uh, it can vary even within a week or even a month and uh, usually the secondary mrs are associated with decreased ejection fraction they have higher mortality and uh, this we already have discussed and coming to the question which you have asked very important is what is the uh, how to sort of what parameters are used into uh, differentiate primary mr and secondary mr now these are the two parameters so when you look at primary mr uh, always remember when you are discussing when you talk about effective regurgitant orifice area more than 0.4 cm we say it is severe mr regurgitant volume more than 60 ml we say it is severe mr but when you come to secondary mr it is just half of it your effective regurgitant orifice area will be 0.2 and the regurgitated volume will be 30 ml so this is these are the two primary you know the main parameters uh, which needs to be told and which needs to be used when you are trying to uh, assess the severity of mr so you have a lower threshold for secondary mr does that answer your question sir why is it so yes, sir thank you yeah now the problem has been that uh, the methods which are used uh, are the ones which are causing problems now when we look at the effective regurgitant orifice area the how do we come and I mean, how do we uh, arrive at this method we use the pisa method right so we use the pisa method to look at the eroa 
Now, the PISA is very reasonably reliable in a primary MR. The reason is the uh, orifice sh uh, shape is more or less circular. And uh, when you have a circular orifice, and when you have a primary MR, especially when we were talking in terms of a rheumatic heart disease, where it is going to be fixed, it is not going to change because the leaflets are already sort of, uh, you know, diseased and they are fixed. So in that, what happens is when you use the PISA, the hemisphere is a true hemisphere. And when you have a true hemisphere, that means you have a circular orifice and the hemisphere is a true hemisphere. These values are very reliable. But when it comes to the secondary MRs, the uh, pathology here is different. Here you have more of annular dilatation. That is when you have an LV in, which is dilated. So when the LV dilates, what happens is the annulus dilates. And when the annulus dilates, the two leaflets don't meet each other. And when they don't meet each other, they form an orifice which is not circular. It is more a crescentic or orifice. It is more an elliptical ellipsoid type of orifice. When you have an elliptical or a crescentic orifice, the hemisphere is not truly reflective because you are, the whole calculation is based on the orifice being circular. So when you don't have a circular orifice, the hemisphere is not going to be reliable. Then what happens is you tend to overestimate the effective regurgitant orifice area. So this was found out over repeated studies and many studies showed that the uh, EROA was overestimated, the MR was being given too severe and the technique was found to be at fault. So they decided to decrease the threshold and keep it at zero, you know, half of uh, the uh, value of uh, primary MR. So that is the reason. It's an issue with the uh, hemisphere with an issue with the PISA. Is that okay? Thank you, sir. Sir, but the regurgitant fraction is same in both, sir. Like, uh, reason for that, sir? The regurgitant fraction is not going to be affected. It is primarily uh, the, the, the volume that is going to be compared with the volume of uh, the LVOT is not going to change much. But the method to look at the uh, volume is different. But when you look at the, uh, the orifice, that is the uh, shape of the uh, orifice. And that is where the, the problem is. When you have a forward flow, which is the same, the stroke volume, which is same at the LVOT, and when you have uh, the flow, which is going back into the, uh, through the regurgitant orifice, the flow is not really uh, affected in terms of fraction because you are comparing it as a fraction. But when you look at volume as a singular uh, or an individual parameter, that is different. But when you compare it with another volume, you are fractionated, that is not going to be affected. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, in eccentric MR, sir, which method will be most appropriate to quantify MR, sir? In an eccentric MR, you can use uh, the Wiener contractor. PISA is not generally reliable. So Vena contractor would be a better method to use in eccentric MR. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir. Any other question? Sir, uh, sir, how do we set the optimum uh, aligning velocity for MR, sir? For MR or AR, both. Like optimum aligning velocity, sir. You are talking about, okay, the, the velocity, the normal velocity. As far as uh, validated data, the publication, whatever has been published initially, it was based on a velocity scale which ranged from 50 to 70 centimeters on the color scale. So that is why that has been taken as the standard. And every time one does, we always use that particular scale because the published data very early on use that particular scale so 50 to 70 centimeters so if you are looking at for example an acute mr where your 
uh, flow will be uh, high, there is a hypertension there is going to be left atrial pressure which is going to be increased you are going to look at a flow which is going to be very sort of uh, low velocity then you can decrease your velocity scale bring it down so that your mr tends to be uh, seen much better so that is the range 50 to 70 when you feel that there is tachycardia and you are not seeing the mr properly then what you do is you can go above 70 but be very careful when you do these parameters because you should know what you're doing so 50 to 70 is the range anything less than 50 for low flows anything above 70 when you have uh, uh, high velocity flows for example in a patient with anemia or with tachycardia where a lot of aliasing is occurring you increase the scale that is as far as the uh, aliasing velocity is concerned thank you sir so there's role of uh, color m mode in case of mr sir yes that also can definitely be used so that is an alternative way of looking at the uh, mr whether it is holosystolic and when is it peaking when is it seen uh, it is the same as doppler but uh, these since the sampling rate is uh, better so that can definitely be used but the principle is the same so what you see on continuous wave doppler more or less you'll see the same thing on color m mode so it is up to you you can use uh, you can use both of them or either of them so primarily it is to time the mr when does it peak when does it come when does it stop when does it taper so that was what uh, the color m mode provides okay oh, okay sir uh, any other doubts uh, anyone has i i think sir uh, you have covered uh, everything sir about uh, mitral valve sir yeah uh, this was just to focus on the basics because uh, there is a lot of uh, attention on the basics because the common cons you know the the impression is that you people don't spend time in the echo room and then you don't do echoes so they want to know how much you know echo and uh, that's the reason why i spent a lot of time on the basics yeah sir <laughs> you are right sir actually <laughs> okay uh, uh sir uh, next week we'll have sir uh, one more class uh, maybe sure. But I'll I'll ask my colleague sir uh, regarding maybe aortic valve assessment we can go and then uh, sure uh, I'll I'll ask a discuss sir let me know a few days yes. later already yes sir uh, sir uh, uh, yes. so we do record the class sir and we put on YouTube on a public uh, platform so is it okay with you sir please or please go okay okay sir okay thank thank you sir sure thank you sir good night sir thank you sir thank you sir. thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir